I think we can turn to another intangible thing, which is music. And this is what Janet Pokoroba has done so brilliantly in her wonderful memoir, The Fourth String, Sensi and Me, which chronicles this period of very intense study of the shamisen, this wonderfully iconic and idiosyncratic instrument of, of Japanese culture. And it's just intriguing to be able to read this memoir, and which illuminates so many different aspects as so gracefully and eloquently of how music and people and culture are intertwined. And Jenna Pokoroba, of course, has been writing for many years, and her involvement with Japanese performing arts spans over two decades and two continents, which is another intriguing element of her work that really comes to the fore in her writing, this interplay between between cultures and, and music as a vehicle for negotiating this. Her writing has appeared in numerous publications, including Metropolis, the Harvard Review, uh, Kyoto Journal, and the Indiana Review. And I won't tell you any more about her biographical details because you can read them on the back cover of her book. Instead, I want to give her plenty of time to introduce one of the main protagonists in her book, which is, of course, the shamisen itself. But I will leave you with one biographical detail to ponder, which the significance of this will come to light as you listen to Janet tell you more about the shamisen, and that is that she lives in Vermont with two cats. So it's my great pleasure to welcome this evening Janet Pokoroba. Thank you so much for um, that enthusiastic uh, and very articulate welcome. You know, when I come to events like this, people often ask, well, you know, what do you need? And, you know, and I don't really need much, but <laughs> it's the shamisen that uh, is quite an unforgiving instrument and, and needs a lot. So it's a little, it's, it's more complicated than I am. And, and as, um, as we said, it's, it's a protagonist. So um, I am going to speak about the shamisen tonight, and I'm very excited to do so here at the Japan Society um, of New York. I'd like to thank Tomomi Sekia for all of her help in arranging, and all of her staff in arranging this and making this very easy for me to just come down and slip right into the programming here. I mean, what an honor to be featured here, really. Um, Big thank you to Dr. Bradley Strauss and Shara for coming, for being, you know, all that you are and that you're going to bring to our conversation. I'm extremely excited um, to meet you and to talk. Um, and to Michael Palmer, I don't know if he's here, but um, uh, the publicist at Stonebridge Press, who was very, um, is a singular person and uh, does wonderful work here um, with the Japan Society. So, you know, when I saw the title of this event, which I did not choose, I don't know who chose it, but it was brilliant. The allure of the shamisen, I just said, perfect. There really couldn't be a better name for this talk and for this um, iconic instrument. In fact, one day when I was in the middle of my apprenticeship with my teacher, um, a newspaper article appeared about this. So I'm going to just read a section here about that. One day in the English newspaper, there was an article titled Shami Sensuality, <laughs> written by a middle-aged Japanese man journalist, who confessed he had never heard the shamisen. Reviewing a concert, he described the shamisen's erotic charm, its ability to fan the embers of desire. Honestly speaking, he wrote, I felt myself becoming sexually aroused. 
How dumb, I said to Sensei. It's not about sex. What a jerk. (laughs) She shook her head. So sad, he doesn't know about his own culture. And we resumed our talk of the music's subtlety and grace, its refinement and poise. I don't know who we were kidding. Love was in the air all the time, in the music, in the songs, the stories. It was the root of all trouble, celebrated most when doomed. Unrequited disasters infused the music with a sad sweetness that throbbed. If love was impossible, it was also unsullied and pure. So there we were, judging this poor man, when in reality, in his very first listen, he had gotten it right. He had gotten something right. You know, my teacher um, taught foreigners exclusively. She was not a conventional teacher. And she herself, she was alluring in her own way, and she herself talked about her lessons being seductions. Um, and I just want to read a tiny piece of that. Um, and, and for her, you know, she was giving us access and experience to this beautiful, strange, complicated thing, this shamisen. So she called it um, a seduction. But, you know, to her, music was honorable. This was the most important thing you could be doing with your life. You know, you had a purpose. You know, so for her, Shamisen was rescuing me (laughs) from, you know, sitting idly in cafes, you know, sipping cocktails and just, you know, doing nothing, frittering away my time. Uh, So so this was important. Um, I didn't think her seduction applied to me, but it did. My schedule revolved around our lessons, and I shuttled often down the big road in the wintry air, music bundle hugged to my chest, to where she was waiting in her rooms, her hair a smooth curtain, her inky eyes warm with humor, and the space heaters pulsing at our feet. It was no different from any number of times when I'd been taken with a new romance. In fact, it all had a slightly erotic charge to it, She talked about a student dumping her or about having a crush on a piece of music. Once, when a student overslept and missed a lesson, she said, he slept over. (laughs) And when we told her the real meaning, she just laughed and repeated the joke even more. She didn't seem interested in romance in real life, but the hint of it was fun and playful and perhaps more important than the real thing. And, and that is going to come back around in my talk as well. Um, so, so this shamisen definitely has had a lot of power um, in, in alluring foreigners and Japanese alike. And so we'll try to figure out what that is in this talk. Um, but first, I want to give you a little bit of um, historical and cultural and aesthetic grounding um, uh, context for this instrument and its performance traditions. So uh, tradition has it, I mean, apparently, the shamisen appeared, first arrived in Japan uh, through the port of Sakai near Osaka around 1562. Um, What appeared at that time existed in the Ryukyu Islands, now Okinawa, at the time. And that was a very small banjo, probably a third of the size of that, uh, a very small sound box covered with snakeskin and played with a little slip, little sliver of bamboo. Um, and that was nearly identical to a Chinese instrument called the sanshin. Um, they were both very tiny and almost toy-like. You know, they looked like novelties or something. Um, you know, but, they, but they were played and, and, and musical. And, um, but, but once this little instrument got to the Kansai area uh, in Japan, um, it really uh, got taken in and adopted, as many things have in Japan over the years, 
and by Biwa players. Now the players of the Biwa, the Biwa was a very big uh, lute, kind of pear-shaped lute. Um, and it uses a very big plectrum, and I think the players were blind. Um, but it, it was a very um, striking instrument back then, and so they they saw this little thing and thought, well, let's you know, let's let's improvise, let's play with this, let's see let's see what it can do. So they found that it actually sounded better when they played it with their big heavy picks. So Im improving and enlarging the pick was the first uh, change that happened. Um, and then as soon as they did that, they discovered that, well, the, you know, the sh snake skin isn't holding up very well under this sharp pick. We need something more uh, stronger and that might resonate and, and give this a more percussive feel. So that's where they started using um, skins from cats um, or dogs. Uh, so, so that changed uh, as well. And then they just lengthened it, thickened the neck, made it longer. And um, with a few more tweaks, um, using, using bridges and plectrums and all of that, um, they also carved up the interior to help with the sound, to make some nice carvings. Um, and then it became what you see before you today. Uh, you know, it, it evolved into what it is, and then it's just stayed that way for a very long time. Um, it hasn't changed in hundreds of years. There are a few kinds of shamisen. There are three. Um, this one that you see before you uh, is the smallest one. Uh, Hosozao, I think it's called. Um, there's another one that's very large, and then there's a middle-sized one. And I'll, I'll be mentioning the larger one um, as well. But um, the fact that it hasn't changed, I found very unusual. In fact, I've often wondered why. Now, the shamisen is known for its sound, I think. Um, it's really got that unique kind of sweet, sour snap to it. It's percussive, it's a string, it's kind of sad sounding, it's got a melancholy. Um, it's known for a kind of buzzing resonance called sawardi, which comes from the first string. There are three strings. Um, shamisen actually means three taste string. And this first string at the top of the neck, the other two reside on a little piece of metal, and the first string does not. It sits right on the wood, and so it has a different kind, almost like a different layer of resonance, and it, it's very buzzy, and um, you can assess a shamisen by the, by the you know, its quality, by, by the sawari. So that's all fine, but what I discovered soon after learning how to play it, and, and something that I think is lesser known, is how fickle it is, and how fickle its tuning is. Um, it's not, the, the strings are not secured in any way, uh, like they might be in a guitar or a lute. So what happens is, as soon as you start to play, the strings slip out of tune. And mastery of the instrument is really learning how to tune it as you play it. So in other words, you don't just tune and then you're good to go. Um, I played with a violinist once and, you know, I was just so envious because she could go on and on and on and on and on. But I kept, you know, for me, I have to find the places in the music where I can do that quickly, invisibly, without stumbling. And so that's, that's the mastery. But I find it very interesting that it's not all set. You have to keep doing it. It's endless. It's endless. The micro movements will never stop. You will just keep doing that until the music stops. So that was one surprise. And one question that I had, which was, you know, why, why don't you nail down those strings? <laughs> Make this easier to play. Also, the neck of the shamisen, which is actually quite heavy, um, is, is fretless. So you really have no indication of what you're doing. You, you don't know where the positions are. Um, and, and just being off a little bit is not so pleasant. So it, you know, it has this really 
precise nature and and that you have to um, really get used to. So um, these are a couple of things that make it somewhat vexing. Um, and I think in the book, I describe it like a, holding a giraffe. You know, it feels like a giraffe in your arms because when you want it to be steady, it slips. And then when you want it to slip, it doesn't slip. So it's just... Uh, an understatement to say it's a vexing instrument to play. It requires a lot of control. Um, but of course, I, I didn't talk about any of this with anybody, nobody, <laughs> until I wrote about it. Um, you know, I just had all these questions like, why don't you add frets? And, and why, why don't you fix this instrument? It's so infuriating to play and it's so difficult and it's painful. <laughs> uh, you sit on your knees in the seiza position. Um, the pick is heavy. It's at this impossibly difficult angle to hold it. Um, and so I just wondered a lot about why this instrument was the way it was. But I didn't, I didn't say anything. I just, to me it felt like, uh, it almost felt childish to be asking questions at that point. <laughs> you know, I was in the room, I was embarking on this instrument and it, it just suddenly felt like a very serious thing, like something, I was gonna learn something really important here. Um, so I never asked those questions. Um, I have a friend in Japan, a long-term expat, uh, she's, she's still there. And she said that she figured out when she first went to Japan that for her it was about holding on to her questions. You know, you can't just go around saying whatever you think and asking everything. You really have to just hold on to things and just let the question be. Um, and so that's what you do. And that's what I did with all these questions about the shamisen. I just let them be and they just go inside somewhere into a place, um, you know, into the place of, you know, the file folder in there of unanswered, unknown things. Uh, but living in Japan, by the time you leave and you go home, you have a really big file of unknown things. <laughs> and uh, it's actually a little bit comforting to know that there are unknown things in a way, and to know you don't to know that you don't know everything, <laughs> which I think is something that the book is very much about. Um, I. I feel like I went there knowing nothing and I left there knowing nothing. Except I knew that I knew nothing at the end. So, um, if that's sounding a little baffling, good. <laughs> because it all is. Um, but, um, so, the idea of space is really important with the shamisen. And there's um, a, a technical term. It's, it's an aesthetic term in all Japanese art. Um, it's called ma, and it means a kind of silence. It's the silence between sound, is how she explained it to me. A live blank. Um, you know, when I was playing piano or trombone, you know, in high school, and we were resting, we were always just sort of, you know, talking. <laughs> but this is a very different kind of thing. Um, I was just telling Dr. Bradley before, before the talk, um, that Stephen Sondheim, when he came to Japan to learn about Japanese music, to write Pacific overtures, he spent only about six weeks, and that's all he needed to really know that Japanese music is not about the note at all. It's about the approach to the note and leaving the note. So again, those spaces around, um, and this took a very long time to get used to. I, I went there thinking it's all about the note, right? So the seminal text on, on Japanese musical, musical instruments and music, um, pretty much still, I think, is by Dr. William Malm. And he went to, the, uh, to Japan in the 50s and studied a lot of instruments and studied the shamisen. Um, and he said um, that of all the traditional instruments of Japan, he, he thought shamisen had the greatest variety of uses. Um, he said it's the backbone of the kabuki theater which it is, um, and a vital ingredient at every party, a social grace in many homes, which I found very charming to read uh, in 2019. <laughs> um, when I arrived in Japan in 1996, uh, I was teaching English, and I, um, I met my teacher very soon, and then I was so excited that I had something Japanese to talk about, so I brought it to my students, and I said, I'm learning shamisen. 
<laughs> and they just said, what? <laughs> um, they, they, they hadn't heard it. And, um, you know, I, of course I expect, oh, you must know everything. Of course they, they didn't, they didn't. That's not, that's not what their lives were about. Um, one woman told me it was wife training. Um, and I said, really? I mean, she was very insistent that this was about learning obedience and uh, you know duty and loyalty and patience so you would make a good wife. And this vexed me too, for obviously <laughs> obviously for myself, but um, you know my teacher was not a wife. she was not a she was not very obedient either. Um, so I thought, oh, you know, what is this thing? Um, but she um, she taught it to foreigners because she she felt like we had a passion to learn. Um, and, uh, which I want to get into a little bit of the performance traditions in traditional Japanese music, because I think in the West here, it's very easy for us to just sort of get together and play music. It's not uncommon. Um, where I live in Japan now, there's a lot of, um, like old time music, so a lot of people play fiddle or mandolin, and they're just always get accordion. <laughs> they get together and just make music, and it's really fun. Um, that doesn't happen <laughs> at all, um, as you can imagine. Um, so for her, having this passion for the music, but not wanting to play it in the traditional way, which I will explain. Um, she needed um, another way. And so for her, it was to teach with foreigners because we could be informal and we could just um, enjoy. It. And, and she really felt that music was about spirit and passion. It was not about status or money or anything like that. So if, um, if you are a shamisen player, a traditional one in Japan, the highest achievement that you can reach or earn on the instrument is status as a ningen kokuho, a living national treasure. Uh, this is not for just performing arts. Um, uh, it's all, all arts. Um, this, this level of uh, becoming a preserver of an important intangible, in music, intangible cultural property. And this is something bestowed on the artist, usually late in their career, when they've risen to a status where they have um, demonstrated and probably taught and passed on a lot. Um, for example, Thomas Saburo or Kiku Gordo got their Ninge and Koko Hos in their 60s. Um, and my drum teacher in Japan, her name was Katara Kikuyu, and her teacher was Katara Kisaku, and he was a Ningen Kokoho, which we thought was just terrific, like, ooh, we're one touch away from a national treasure, but she lamented it because it made him more expensive. <laughs> if you have to pay him to play with you, watch out. <laughs> um, because you see, in Japanese music, you pay to play. Um, every performance piece has its price tag, uh, which I didn't realize uh, when I went. So. In, in shamisen, if I wanted to perform that, I would, um, you know, I would need other people to accompany me. And so depending on how many people you need, how many instruments, uh, if you're a dancer, do you need makeup? Do you need wigs? Do you need props? Uh, little people to scramble out on stage and hand you a fan? Uh, that all gets added up. Um, and, you know, thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars. Um, and... It's just the way it is. And the money is fascinating because it's all cleaned first <laughs> and it's put in these beautiful envelopes and it's very ritualized and it's very unmoney like. But um, it is what sort of keeps things going. Um, it kind of runs the show and there's a lot of um, bowing and a lot of, um, you know. It, this, this idea of the money and the eliteness and what it takes to really learn these arts is, uh, is the one thing that my teacher was battling against, um, right? Um, but the question becomes, you know, how do you, how do you pass on the kata? So kata is the form, right? 
the, the, the art form. Now, whether that's karate or shamisen or dyeing uh, fabrics, um, there's a way of doing things, right? So I'm going to just dip back into the book here at one point. I do talk about kata in the very beginning because my teacher, this was very strange. My, when I went to, for my first lesson, I thought I was going to learn the shamisen, but before I could do that, she needed a singer for something, for a show, for a performance in like three weeks. And she said, um, why don't you do that first and then we'll get started on the shamisen. And to this day, I don't know if that was a test. I don't know what that was about. But all I knew is that I couldn't sing. And I just said, this is not going to work. I mean, it's clearly I'm not a singer. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and she assured me it would work, you know. And she said, you know, just... Um, just join. It's going to be okay. But the thing that saved me were the kata. A form, or kata, is a precise exercise, a foundational stroke. Kata is a boundary or skin, my journals say, where the individual heart meets collective experience. Kata are what allow a beginner to go on stage <laughs> to join the flow providing safe harbor in unknown seas. The kata sets you up for a lifetime of artistic practice. A kata was reliable. Embodying a kata meant being recognizable in the world. So even though this music was not comprehensible to me yet, I mean, I would literally listen to these tapes and I was a musician, I had been playing piano since seven, and I was about 28 by then. And I could not nail it down. It's like I didn't have the right ears yet to hear it. It was, I made a, a, a staff, a Western staff, you know, and I would try to make notes. But it was like nothing that I knew. So that was a problem. <laughs> but because there was a kata, for how I was supposed to be on stage, meaning sitting on my knees, I had a singing fan, there were lots of different things that I, was, I could do and just fit in until it started to make sense later. So you see, when you learn the shamisen, you don't understand anything. You just hopefully get to that later and it will just come. Um, and that is exactly the opposite of what I was used to. I was used to having all of these ways to nail it down and understand it first. You know, you have to do all that first, right? Um, but not so. Not so. You, um, it, it's a very, you're thrown in. Thrown in. So that's a little bit about the performance tradition. Um, and um, so, so these Ningen Kokoho and anybody who's studying these traditions, that is their very important role, is to keep this tradition, this form. You memorize it, you play it, and then you pass it on. Okay. So what this means is that not only the shamisen itself, but the music that I studied was literally a doorway to Edo, the Edo period in Japan, uh, which ended around 1830. 40, something like that. It was 200 years, so from the mid-1600s to mid-19th century, Japan closed its borders. Um, Kyoto was the capital. You know, there was the shogun in Tokyo, and they just, it was a very restrictive society, um, the Edo period. But this is really the greatest cultural legacy, or one of the greatest cultural legacies from Edo is the shamisen and its music, really. Um, this music at the time in the kabuki theater um uh, they, they're called naga uta so naga nagai being long songs so that is what i studied naga uta i studied naga uta and only naga uta uh because that's what you do um at one point i remember discovering the puppet theater i saw that you just had puppets here oh my god i would have been there at the puppet making um I love the bunraku, um, and I love the music. If, has anybody seen the bunraku? I mean, the shamisen is wild. It's just really crazy. And so I, <laughs> I was at a party once, and I met a woman who's who was a professional gidayu bunraku player. She said, "I'll teach you," 
And I took that back to my teacher and I said, I'm, I'm going to learn this thing. She said, oh, okay, well then you'll have to quit Nagata. <laughs> I said, what? Because <laughs> uh, you can only learn one thing. You can't, you can't learn... Um, you can't learn another style. You can learn another instrument, but not, not another style. Um, and if you want to change anything in the style that you're playing, start a new school. So um, this Nagauta music is a very lyrical form. It's very beautiful. It, it accompanied the rise of the, uh, the kabuki. Um, and it was actually created by a woman. Um, down in the more Kyoto area by the Kamo River, a shrine maiden named Okuni um, just started creating these dances in the 1600s. You know, I don't know if she was a prostitute or you know what the situation is. I, I try to like picture like a wild Madonna like figure or something. So you know, her and her pals were doing these wildly popular dances, and then um, you know, within like 20 years, I think it kind of caught on, and people wanted to sort of. I mean, they said they were causing such a ruckus, you know, they had to shut them down. So the upshot of all that is, is that women can't ever play in the kabuki anymore. So that, that, you know, women were banned. And so now it's all men. And of course, the men play the women. It's called the onagata role, which is um, a kind of cross-dressing role. I mean, a, a, a man will be an onagata for life. Like Thomas Saburo was an onagata all his life. So he, his specialty is playing a woman. Um, and, you know, they, the kabuki is still you know, alive and well today, I would say, in, in Tokyo. Um, it's still telling its tales of love and revenge and the supernatural. Um, you know, when you go to the kabuki, you you hear people in the audience sometimes um, saying things like, you know, mate imashita, you know, I was waiting for that, or, you know, these um, little moments where, you know, the, the audience knows the script, you know, it, it, it used to be that embedded in daily life that they, they would actually be almost participating in the drama and calling out from the audience, and the actors loved it. So it was very you know, integrated. Um, and I was at the Kabuki once, and I heard, I love hearing these guys, and they, they sit in the back, and they say, you know, Yamato ya, mate mashita, you know, all these things. And my, um, my friends and my teacher would say that a lot of these people now are plants, <laughs> because people don't know the plays as well anymore. They wouldn't really be able to know when to sort of, when is the big mie coming and you know, when are you going to say that line? So, so they have to be sort of taught this now. In the same way that there's a kimono dressing school now where people go and learn how to dress in kimono rather than just knowing that. Um, so, so the shamisen is, is really this direct connection to the past, which is, I find, really fascinating. And again, it's, this um, form that's preserved th through a very feudal like system, right? It's, it's very, um, it's called the Iemoto system. It's pyramid system, one master at the top, and it's usually a man. Um, and everybody imitates his form, and they're the transmitter of the forms. And everything's passed on like royalty, right? Like through the bloodline. It's like a monarchy. Um, if you're not of that family, you can be adopted into the clan and take their name if you have enough time and money and um, influence and, and loyalty, you know, and um, money, really, because you have to spend a lot of money. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is the system that my teacher was battling against all her life, and I certainly understood why, but, I, but I'm also very thankful that it was there, that it brought me this instrument, you know? I mean, I don't know how else I would be able to play it today. Um, so these systems, which are very archaic and maybe changing slightly now, a little. Um, my my teacher's teacher was actually very much a maverick, and you can hear his story in the book. But mostly, it's 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 the same. But you know, they are preserving the art form. So it's um, I think it's a very mixed um, it's a mixed bag. Um, but um, about Music, um, you know, I, I, I do wonder if I had studied pottery or paper making, if I would have had the same experience and the same intensity with my teacher and my fellow players um, as, as with the shamisen, right? Um, you know, 
like when my teacher had asked me to perform that first day and I, I, I just said, I can't do this. And she kept telling me, better to join better to join you know, join and I think I think she was so right there was something about that music joins us in a way that these other art forms don't and a real intimacy develops between musicians you know it doesn't matter if you've just met them that night for the gig or if you know them well um, you're really going to the same place together you know um, publicly <laughs> uh, I I had a friend who said, I think all musicians are just in love with each other, you know, a little bit, you know, there, there is that sense to it because it's, um, it, it's very intimate. Um, uh, and I think that the sound and being in music was really important for me, uh, in, in getting so close to my teacher. Um, and one learns in Japan through osmosis, right? Um, showing up again, 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 watching again, again, again. Um, uh, I know now that this is called embodied learning. <laughs> uh, I didn't have any of these terms back then. Uh, my teacher would tell me, narao yori nareru. Like, instead of learning, just get used to it. Just have an experience. Experience it, and then the, the, the understanding will come later. And that was really different from what I had experienced before in music. This kind of infection without understanding. You know, that was going to come later. Um, so to learn uh, any anything traditionally in Japan, and definitely shamisen, you do develop a relationship with a teacher that really takes you to the heart of the tradition. Um, and traditional musicians that I've spoken to or done research with, you know, uh, I've talked to them and they said, you really need to study the human life inside the music. It's not just the music. You can't separate the two. Um, and I really found that that was to be true, that I learned about the music um, as much through observing her life and being as close to her as possible. Um, there's a tradition in Japan called the Uchideshi, which is the live-in disciple. It's the one person who, or maybe there's several, but you live with your teacher um, because the exposure to that, you might, you know, be able to catch some, some, some good teachings, you know, while you're sweeping the floor or something. Um, I wasn't, I didn't live with her, but I lived very close, and and she was um, always in my day. So um, I learned, you know, she she would deliver little teachings on the train going to a concert, or you know, all the time. You had to be there. So, uh, and also, I just want to say, too, this was a time, I went in the 90s, so imagine being there without YouTube or Google or GPS, for that matter, <laughs> um, or any of these portals where you can sort of go today and look it up. You can look up Shamisen now and see tons of videos. And... The day that I met her, like the next day, I think, I went looking for a book about Shamisen. You know, I, I had the lesson and I was like, no, I have to, I have to learn this. I have to go to a book. You know, that's, that's my Western me. I have to, you know, study this. And, you know, mom's book was out of print. I couldn't get it. But I'm glad I didn't have all those Google <laughs> sites and, and, and YouTube because those are so easy to go to and think that you know something. You know, and um, it would have been even harder to dismantle that illusion for me, right? I had enough of that coming from the West. Like, I know, I know everything. <laughs> and, um, you know, dismantling all of that was part of the process. Um, but this idea that the shamisen and the music is going to be part of the character development is something that is part of... Um, the learning of this instrument um, and my teacher would talk some time about like learning who a person was through how they played the, the instrument um, we called it her shami psychology <laughs> um, and it was really kind of interesting you know could a student take correction you know could they listen to the criticism could they then change the mistake um, could they you know um, do it differently next time. I mean, those are all things that we would be looking for in Western music, but we wouldn't really be necessarily tying it to character or discipline or anything like that. Um, although it 
definitely is related to all those things. But there's just something about how infused these things were and inseparable um, that I found very compelling and very alluring. They say it takes kokoro, you know, heart, to master the shamisen. Uh, and they also say that it takes empathy, which I find interesting. Um, I was once playing uh, the instrument, and a woman who plays violin came up to me and said, oh my goodness, your relationship with this instrument is so um, uh, intimate. And I, because um, you're really sort of tuning and playing together. Um, and so uh, it's not as distant or separate as um, with the piano, say. Um, so, um, I will wrap up by just saying that, um, let me see, I mean, things that are alluring, I think, are invisible, um, and I just want to leave you with a couple of quotes on that. The, uh, Japanese psychologist Takeo Doi said, the secret of an attractive personality is ultimately related to whether or not there is something secret in that personality. Is it not true, in fact, that nothing attracts people more than a secret? The flower of living cannot bloom without secrets. Um, and the Japanese musicians that I've met um, often study other instruments just so that they know what they're doing so that they can play their instrument better. And I think that kind of devotion uh, and commitment to it, a kind of invisibility, being sort of swallowed by the form and having your, your individual self connected to the form so deeply is just something that I've never experienced um, anywhere. And I think it makes the instrument very um, alluring. So uh, thank you very much for listening. And I will now... Um, give you a sense of the instrument. That little riff in the kabuki would indicate water. People rowing their boats to the pleasure quarters. <laughs> uh, the Nagata songs are very long, so I won't play anything in its entirety. They're like 30 to 40 minutes long. So I'm going to excerpt for you. And I want to excerpt a piece that is a very sober piece. It's played uh, first, usually, in a performance. It's a celebratory piece. It's sort of a silly piece, but um, it ends with uh, praising the emperor uh, and wishing long life. So it's a celebratory piece. And it's called Suihiro Gadi. And so I thought I would give you a sample of a serious, serious piece. Ingo 
つたけもちよこめたるさいしきのは。あどよよよまかりいいでしもはずかしそうにこえはりあげてい,いやよたろうかじゃあるかおまえにねのはやかったいや。たのだひとはきょうもまた。And I will pause there. <laughs> um. Not a, not a playful piece.、Um, uh, and I thought I would just contrast that with a little sort of introductory to a song that's very playful and very much embodies an aesthetic called Ikki,、um, which、uh, is a kind of、uh, sophisticated restraint, a kind of playfulness, flirtation.、Um, uh, And so this、uh, song really embodies it. So to see maybe if you hear something different.、Uh. Shamisen has three tunings, and I'm going to take you into a different tuning. I'm going to show you all of them tonight. I'm going to lower the third string. This changes the intervals a little bit, and I'm going to play a couple things from the kabuki, which I'll bet if,、um, might sound familiar to some of you who know a little bit about kabuki. The first one is from Musume Dojoji. And it's an interlude. Dojoji is a piece about a woman who turns into a snake ghost、uh, because her love is unrequited.、Uh, so, again, it's a little song in the middle of the piece, which is a very pretty song. And it's about the plums and the cherries. And I think all it really says is the, the cherries are the 
older sister to the plums or something like that. It's just being very playful with the blossoms. And thank goodness it's that time of year. We're in spring. Yo. Ho. Yo. Seemed a little low, sorry. <clears throat> I want to switch to a Matsuri festival kind of feeling. Sorry, you got a couple verses on that one. <laughs> um, so there's another tuning called Ni Agardi, which raises the second string, and it's for a lot of love ballads.
So I thought for an alluring uh, presentation, I should play, um, this is a, a song, a geisha song. So it's not a nagauta, it's a kouta, a very short song. And um, this was not my forte, but we would learn these just for fun. very much. You've been a very wonderful audience. I hope that was a good taste of the music. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you. If a picture says a thousand words, then I think the opportunity to hear, mm. but also to see, to experience the totality of the playing of, mm -hmm. of the shamisen, mm -hmm. uh, must say 10,000 or many thousand more words. So mm. thank you so much. Absolutely, absolutely. And the, the visual, it's, it's a very, um, all the instruments is very visual as well. I mean, just um, how you prepare and approach the instrument and all of that. So. One thing that you touched on in yeah. your talk that was so fascinating is this idea of ma, yes. the silence between notes, but also mm. the silence that seems like it's very much part of the culture. And music is, as, as, if you, as you so eloquently expressed, this wonderful portal into mm understanding a culture, what other elements of Japanese culture do you think that your study of, of the shamisen helped you to unpack or oh. to understand? Great question. I think um, that idea of not using the brain and the mind all the time and getting more into the body and um, just doing things and understanding them uh, gradually and getting comfortable with not knowing and not being in control all the time, that was a big one. Um, but the idea of space, of silence, and I think just sheer perseverance, you know, and having the stick to to keep going at something that I, I feel like I can only try <laughs> and fail. But, you know, failure is something that I feel like in the West, we don't see that as a good thing. We don't talk about, well, of course you fail on the way to success, right? So, um, but the Japanese, I would find, you know, gambate, like you are going to fail. So just, you just keep that spirit going. And I love that. I find that so much more helpful for life. <laughs> So do you often have moments in your study of the shamasan where you were ready to pack it all in? <laughs> I sort of did. And you know, oddly, those moments came more when I returned home. And separated from my teacher and my music, I was really lost. And I would go back and forth, and I, I don't know who here has done that, and when you're into cultures like that, it can be tough. And those were the times where I'd wanna just throw it all out the window. And I would wanna throw this out the window, but I thought, well, I can't throw this out the window without throwing my teacher out the window. So that always drew me back. 
<laughs> so in your experience and in your mind, are the yeah. shamasan and your sensei just inextricably yeah. interwoven or do they have independent lives? Oh, they're interwoven. They're interwoven. Absolutely. And that's what made it a joy and also um, a burden. And it's a privilege to have this burden. But at times it did feel like a burden. I, I have often felt guilty leaving Japan. I have often felt like I shouldn't have left her. Should I have brought her here? What does she think of that? What, what's the right thing to do? Well, it's very interesting because it raises this question and I think this realization that the relationship between a teacher and a student mm. is a relationship. It's exactly that with all these complications. And I suppose the question is, both mm. for student and teacher, is mm. there any way to escape a sense of betrayal? Uh, you've gone to the core of everything. Um, well, it's a little bit like leaving home. You know, when you're growing up uh, and you leave home, it's a kind of betrayal. You have to do that, right, to become your own person. Um, and a little bit the same thing with, with learning, right? You sort of have to outdo your teacher or betray them. You, you know, if you're going to really master it and do it and come into your own learning. So, but I felt very mixed about that. Um, because I, I didn't want to betray her. And, you know, I, I, yeah, it was very fraught. And I think there's always the relationship, but for some reason we don't talk about it or we don't really acknowledge that, in, and especially in learning. We learn in relationship. I think this is true even in the West, but we sort of separate them. And I find that to be an artificial separation. Well, this is very interesting. Talk to us more about your experiences as a very serious piano student here in the U.S. and how they, how that differed or how it was similar in terms of the relationship that you develop with a sensei in yeah. Japan. Yeah. Um, well, when I first went to the, the shamisen lesson, I thought I was just going to learn it and go home, and that was it. I did not expect a relationship with the teacher. I did not expect that to happen, because what I knew from piano was that you just, I went once a week on the school bus, and I did my lesson, and I went home. But when I was a piano student, I have to say, I... I deeply loved music. Music was where I was alive and awake, and it was everything. But I was so ambivalent about it because it took me away from my family, from my friends. I mean, our talents isolate us in a way. We have to get used to that, you know. But I think the great thing about Japan was that there was all this unifying going on. I didn't have to separate from my teacher. We were, you know, for a long time very close. You're sort of in their life. Whereas I would feel very separate in America and then very sad about the separation. I wanted to have, a, I wanted to have it all, you know, the purpose, the music, the teacher, um, all together. Now tell us more about your sensei because she sounds, <laughs> on one hand, she's part of this great tradition. She's always, I love the phrase in your book, she's always on Edo time. Yes. So she's there. She's traveled backwards. Yeah. But on the other hand, she's yeah. doing this rather iconoclastic thing, very racy thing, by yeah. focusing her yeah. teaching yeah. on foreigners. Tell us more about why she refused to teach Japanese students. She felt that if she taught Japanese students, there would be expectations of a Japanese sensei, meaning she'd have to charge money, she would have to teach formally, and that it would change her way of teaching, and she wanted to do it her own way. So that was why she didn't want to teach Japanese, and she studied for a long time. She was very masterful, but she really eschewed this money-focused elite world. She was very democratic in that way. But the one thing that I love that you've isolated here is that she was such a contrast and a paradox, and everything sort of was in Japan, right? And it, it took me a while, like, because I always wanted to nail down one thing. I would think, well, who are you? Are you traditional or are you iconoclastic? And I was always trying to just make it one layer, but it was so complex. And I learned over many, many years going back that it was the contrast that was to be embraced, you know, the space between. 
having the contrast was good and part of the culture. You yes. know? <laughs> well, I love your description of your first meeting her and you arrive at her station and she comes out to greet you in kimono <laughs> and obi and in pristine white tabby. Now, talk to us a bit about the relationship between the shamisen mm -hmm. and kimono in traditional dress. Oh, I'm admiring your, your beautiful, I, very appropriate <laughs> spring kimono seasonal. with the cherry blossoms. Yes, my little uh, coat here, Howard. Um, we performed traditionally, which was interesting. She always insisted that we had to be in kimono and we had to be on our knees. So those were things. And she would just say, well, Janet, it's tradition. We can't, we can't change this one. Um, so that's what we did. And so we had to hire dressers and people to come. And it was an all-day event. And getting these things to fit on the foreign bodies. And then we needed big ones for the guys. <laughs> and, you know, it was sort of like all sizes. And uh, it was very, very fun. But it, it, was, it was very elaborate. And I, and I feel that the elaborateness and the rituals in Japan are the implication. You know... There's meaning in them, but there's also, it's just itself. You doing it implicates you in the process, and that's how you just connect to everybody. Very interesting. So, and a much more elaborate, and I, I have to say, aesthetically yeah. beautiful way. It's, it's, perhaps it's akin to Western orchestras maintaining this 19th century idea yeah. of concert dress. Yeah. Well, I'm aware that, that unfortunately, yeah. we're not on edit <laughs> time. I know. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, everybody should have an opportunity to chat with Janet and, and to have a... To, to buy a copy of her really wonderful book. It's just, it's, she's done such an incredible job of articulating the, the ineffable, the intangible here, the, the relationship between teacher and student and the going back and forth uh, between cultures and this balancing act of having a foot in both places. But something yeah. I wanted to ask you, just in conclusion, yeah. um, if any of you have been bitten by the shamisen bug this evening. Mm -hmm. Where can you hear shamisen in the U.S.? Do you have any recommendations of recordings, oh. or, or what would you say to all of us who want to explore this oh, further? Oh, 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 well, ask me up in the reception, and I can, I can tell you some good players to listen to. I mean, here is a great place. Hopefully they, they bring it here. Um, there's not a lot of Nagauta players. One thing, you know, it, it requires a lot of people. Uh, the ensemble, um, but you can certainly hear this music. You can go to YouTube, put in Nagauta, you will get performances by the masters straight, straight coming to you through the digital world. And also, I wanted to say that tonight, please feel free to maybe we can bring it up to the reception to to touch it and to try it. Okay, your your invitation. Well, thank you so much for, for opening worlds for us thank this you. evening. Thank you so Absolutely much. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you for your questions. Thanks.